harvest. Good morning, loved ones. It's great to see you. And one of my favorite parts of going away is coming back. Woo! I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. Bless you. Uh, my wife Jill and I want to let you know we are um, extremely thankful uh, for the grace of rest. Uh, we are, are granted, and uh, it's just important for, uh, for us to know, make sure that you know that we uh, don't take that for granted at all. Uh, try not to for a second, and just so many times in the last month or so, just been uh, grace, grace, and grace, and our family's doing well, and we're all excited to be here today and to rejoin. I mean, really, really, a church we love, people we love, a God that we're so thankful to serve, and that's why time away is so great, it brings the perspective to let you know what is true and what is needed, and and what is right. And so that's happened, and um, I'm excited for what is here today. I'm excited for what God's going to do this year in this church. I'm excited to be with you as we pursue our awesome God together. You guys still got a Bible here? Is still doing Bible stuff around here? That's so great. Of course you are. Of course you are. You've been so blessed. But I've been gone. Once you find a Bible, once you turn to Psalm 51 then. Find a Bible somewhere. Make sure the person beside you has the Bible. We're going to open this and expecting the Lord to work through our lives today in Psalm 51, and we're starting a series today for three weeks, Lord willing, entitled A Change of Heart. A Change of Heart. Psalm 51, found near the center of your Bible, is one of the more beautiful and well-known psalms, but also well-known passages found within Scripture. And the context, the context, of course, for the psalm is found in the inspired title, which is just above verse 1. So if you look at Psalm 51, there's a title that goes with the psalm, and again, that is just as much a part of the inerrant word as any other verse that we will find. And notice the context it provides um, as the title. It says here, it says, uh, to the choir master, a psalm of David. And let me just stop there for a second. Notice to the choir master, this is meant for singing, this is meant for teaching, this is meant not for private, this is meant for public. This psalm was written uh, detailing some of the hardest times of David's life to be used for the benefit of God's people, including us, the church, today. This is here by God, the details again of some really, really hard things and a heart that David puts out on the table and on paper for us to examine in a way that we probably would be very uncomfortable if it was us. But God does that through David's life that we might learn, that we might be blessed. So right from the beginning, this is what we're learning. A psalm for our benefit, a song for the public reading, public singing, a psalm that we may grow from. It says here, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into uh, Bathsheba. So the context that we're learning here is David has committed two grievous sins primarily. There's many other sins that accompany these sins, but the two sins that are first and foremost, the sins of adultery David committed with Bathsheba, and in trying to cover up that sin then, he was led in his own futile thinking to see the murder of Uriah, who of course was the husband of Bathsheba. Nathan is then sent by God, God sends Nathan to confront David. David's sin is then revealed. David's heart then is utterly broken and devastated. And from the outworking of his personal devastation, Psalm 51 then is written and before us right now. Now before we go any further too, I want us to see this. The Bible is not just full of stories of people who did everything right. The Bible is not just full of success stories that we read over and over again in some way we'd be inspired, but at the end of the day, if it was only success stories, we'd be utterly depressed and discouraged because we'd be like, what's wrong with us, right? But what God does in the Bible, he presents a portrayal of real people in real life who had real triumphs, but also real and disastrous failures. I want you to be encouraged with the fact that you hold in your hands the written word of God that he has given to us to encourage us both in the good and the difficult and the hard and the misery miserable of life, that we are now to see this and to learn from David's life and his mistakes that we might grow and learn as a benefit what he went through, that Lord willing, we wouldn't have to suffer in the same way if we glean the wisdom that God has for us. All this to say, be encouraged by the discouragement of David, but also be encouraged by the grace that David finds in the mercy and the love of the one and only God. This psalm is an opportunity this week and the weeks to follow. This psalm God wants to use to do great things in your heart and in mine. Psalm 51 becomes a photograph of David's heart. It's a picture of a man unpacking the seriousness of sin, but the amazing grace of God. So we are fools if we don't learn from this. 
We are foolish if we brush this off. We are wise, though, if we take heed lest we fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. He uses the examples of failures in the people of Israel, and then he says, lest you think you fall, take heed lest you fall. If you think you're going to stand, take heed lest you fall. We are wise if we take heed to the truth before us right now to think that we are beyond falling. This psalm, I suggest to you, will have three main sections in the outline that we're going to see over the next three weeks. We're going to see this today. We're going to see a heart of confession. And from a heart of confession, we're going to see a heart that is cleansed. That's next week. Create in me a clean heart. And from there, we will then see a heart of conviction. And here's the process of the heart, again, I give to you to mull over and to digest. The genuine heart of confession before God in our sin will lead to a genuine heart that is cleansed. A heart that is cleansed will lead to a heart of conviction. Confession is, have mercy on me, O God, I have sinned before you. Con- a cleanse is, create in me a clean heart, O God. Confession leads to cleansing. And from cleansing, then David says, Teach me, I will then teach transgressors your ways. I will go from confession in my sin to being cleansed by God to now a resolve to be used of God because I've learned from my mistakes. I've received mercy and cleansing from God and now I'm resolved to be used to teach others to learn from where I've been and what I've done. A heart of confession, a heart of, that is cleansed and a heart of conviction. Confession, cleansing, and conviction. The power and the potential of a series like this is that you never move beyond the process for the heart, never. You never move beyond this process of confession, cleansing, and conviction. No matter where we find ourselves, we are always in line for a change of heart. Now, if your heart like, is like mine, and it is because we're all sinners together, if your heart is like mine, then you will find your heart at times to be hard. You will find your heart at times to be indifferent you will find your heart at times to be just flat out lazy. You will find your heart to be at times distant and cold and not feeling the affections for God that you think it should. If your heart is like mine, at times you will find it to be unrepentant. And that is why then every day our heart is in need of change because that's the process of the Christian life, to confess, to be cleansed, and to be filled with conviction. And so think of all the hearts in the room right now. Think of all the different hearts in different places and the different needs God's calling you because he loves you. And God's calling me because he loves me. And so we're praying most of all that God would change hearts. He's the only one who can. I mean, even the theme verse for this whole series, create in me a clean heart. Who does the creating? God does. Oh God, create in me a clean heart. Only God can create a clean heart. But we need to run to him to desire that to happen. Let me pray as we begin this time now. Father, this is a serious series in a lot of ways, but it's also very exciting the opportunity, Lord, for a changed heart. Lord, we all need a changed heart in one way or another, Lord, whether it be the very beginning of salvation itself, Lord, the continued process of sanctification of growing more in Jesus Christ. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, by your grace and mercy and love, would you change our hearts? May there be genuine confession and genuine cleansing and genuine conviction over this week and the weeks to follow. I pray right now, Lord, you are speaking as only you can by your Holy Spirit to every individual who can hear this message right now. How exciting it is, Lord, to know you can do what we cannot. But I pray, Lord, you will find us willing, ready, and wanting, Lord, wanting to identify ourselves with David that we might also receive the mercy and the grace and the love of our God today. Change us, O oh God. Create in us clean hearts, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 51, verse 1. Check it out. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being 
and you teach me wisdom. What does God care most about? The secret heart. God cares most about the heart. Today what we have here is a front row seat as to a genuine heart of confession and what it truly looks like. Loved ones, discipline yourself right now. Discipline yourself to search your heart. Discipline yourself in asking God to change your heart. We know this, at least we need to know, a heart of confession is not casually saying, forgive my sins, God, and then moving on to the rest of our day. No, a true heart of confession is so much more, so much deeper, so much more powerful, so much life-giving. You and I both know this too. It's so easy to skim the surface of our sin without ever dealing with the root. But the problem biblically is, if we don't deal with the root, then we'll never change the fruit. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us aren't too happy with the fruit of our lives. The fruit hanging from our tree, we're not excited about. Why isn't it changing? Why isn't it changing? Because you've never actually tackled the root. If you don't get to the root, you won't change the fruit. And we blame others. We, we rationalize our situations. We try to call it something what it isn't. We make all these excuses up. But the reality is the reason the fruit is still what it is on our tree is because we haven't had the humility and the transparency and the heart of confession enough to actually peel it open, get the root out, and plant something fresh, new, and right in return. What David does today, man, he gets the root on the table. He's bearing himself completely. And as awful as his sin is, you will find that he will find the amazing grace of God meets him in tremendous mercy and blessing and love. The reality here today is that in this room, sin is everywhere. It just is because we're all sinners. There's obvious sin in this room. Listen, there's hidden sin in this room. There are lives that are living double lives here. There are lives that are living lies. There are people right now, you're saying one thing when you show up here and then you go and do something else. There are people who are in dark rooms and in places that you think no one sees and there's sins that are occurring. But you have to know that God sees. And we're going to see that today. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden from God. The reality here today is sin is everywhere. But hear this, hear this, hear this. The reality here today is grace is everywhere. Grace is everywhere. We're going to see today, as great as our sin is, our Savior and His grace is greater. But it's the heart of confession that accesses the grace that powerfully frees us from our sin. It takes a heart of confession to know they need to cry out for the mercy of God. First John chapter 1, if, if, the condition is if, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us and cleanse us, and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive, to forgive, to forgive, and to cleanse. If, if, if you confess, faithful and just forgive and cleanse. So then the heart of confession becomes, becomes the thing that breaks the dam of sin. And when the dam of sin is broken, what rushes upon us is the power and the grace and the love of God to flow freely through our lives once again. It's the heart of confession that sends the dark storm clouds away and invites the warm and the glory of the sun to be seen again. This is the power of the heart of confession we see today through the life of David. So what we're going to do is we're going to see four signs of a genuine heart of confession from our passage today. Four signs of a genuine heart of confession. Here's the first sign. Here's the first sign that you and I have a genuine heart of confession. It's this. Um, it cries out for mercy. It cries out for mercy. If my heart is in a genuine place of confession, there's one place I'm going. I'm going for the mercy of God, and I cry out for it. Look at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. David cries out in the midst of his despair. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly, that's so beautiful, from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Notice right away, loved ones, notice the seriousness of David's confession. I mean, we're looking before us right here at truly a broken man. Notice this. This is so important to see as we deal with our own sin, as we deal with the reality of the difficulty of sin in our lives. Notice this. Notice there are no excuses. Notice there's no rationalization. Notice there's no fault finding. Notice there's no blame shifting. David has got his sin on the table and he's crying out for one thing, God's mercy from one person, from God the Father. 
The two sins primarily David is confronted with, as we know, were adultery and murder. Both of these sins under the law of God were punishable by death. The Mosaic law provided no forgiveness for these. The sacrifice of a thousand goats or a thousand sheep could not atone for such sin. David knows this to be true, and therefore, due to the hardness and the devastation of his own heart, the only hope he has is to cry out for, listen, for the undeserved and unmerited mercy of his God. His only hope for mercy is found in his God. And this is so critical and important then for us to understand. Because the only way a sinner can approach God is solely by the mercy and the grace of God. The sinner does not stand a chance, does not have a hope apart from the undeserved mercy of God. If our sin was placed on a table and is piled as high as we could see, we could try for every cleansing agent we could think of, but nothing would work. Nothing would work except for the mercy and the grace and the love of God. And David knows this, you see? So, so put yourself in the understanding of this truth. David knows he's dead by himself. And that's why then the passion comes out to cry for the mercy of God. When you know you have one Savior and one way to be forgiven, you're not treating that casually. This then becomes not a casual line of confession. For David, this is a repentance that is ripping him apart. It's ripping him apart because all he has in this moment, he knows his whole life is relying on the mercy, on the grace, and the love of his God. Notice in verses 1 and 2, notice three words used for sin. Can you find them there? Three used words for sin, transgressions, iniquity, and sin. But notice also in verses 1 and 2, three used words for God's love or God's mercy. Mercy, steadfast love, and abundant mercy, which means compassion. This is so awesome. So hear this truth. For every act of sin, ready, loved ones? There's an offer of grace. For every act of sin, whether it be transgression or iniquity and sin, there's an offer of grace and mercy and steadfast love and abundant mercy. As awful as David's sin is, and ours is too, more amazing is the grace and mercy of God. Transgression here refers to our rebellion against God. Iniquity here refers to our perversion or our depravity of our nature. Sin here refers to falling short of the mark, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Transgression, iniquity, sin, bad news, met with the good news, mercy, steadfast love, and abundant mercy. The mercy of God is his unmerited, loving assistance to those who are found to be pitiful, us. Steadfast love is an inexhaustible supply of God's love. His abundant mercy is His compassion. He feels our hurt. He sees us in our devastation. He cares, and He calls us to be restored to Himself. You see, so this is the heart of confession. The genuine heart of confession sees sin, but more, the genuine heart of confession sees mercy even more. Notice David, he says, blot out. He says, wash me. He says, cleanse me. How does David view his sin? has absolute filth. But he sees the mercy of his God again as even greater. I want you to see that where there's transgression, you find mercy. Where there's iniquity, you find steadfast love. Where there's sin, you find abundant mercy. So may we see our sin. These things go together. May we see our sin. May we see his mercy even more. May we understand the reality of our sin, but even more we understand the mercy and the love and the grace of our God that meets us there if we ask him. If you and I have a genuine heart of confession, we cry out for mercy. We cry out for mercy. And secondly, we do this. We suddenly see clearly. If I have a genuine heart of confession, I will suddenly see clearly. Look at verse three. Verse three, he says, for I know for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Loved ones, one of the greatest hindrances to spiritual revival is spiritual blindness. One of the greatest hindrances to spiritual revival, whether in a life, in a leader, in a church, is spiritual blindness. There are families, there are leadership teams, there are churches sitting in stagnancy because they can't see their sin. 
And if you can't see your sin, then you can't own your sin. You can't own your sin, you can't be freed from that. In John chapter 7, Jesus said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, everything's about the heart, it's on the screen here for us too, we can see it here, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, everything is about the heart, again, again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If the roots are bad, the fruit is bad. If the tree's not going to be healthy, the heart's not healthy. Out of his heart will flow, will flow rivers of living water. This isn't stagnant, unmoving water. Out of his heart, as belief comes, will flow rivers of living water. The very next verse in John says this. It says that this was about the Spirit, and he said this about the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, who would live within his disciples. Heart flow rivers are to occur through the life of the believer who sees clearly and actively pursuing his God. Now let's get our theology straight just for a second. Regeneration is the theological term for when we are born again, when we go from death to life, when we are made as new creations, and a regeneration, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit once and for all, never to leave us again. That's regeneration. That's born again. That's, again, becoming a new creation. But we also know from Scripture, even though the Holy Spirit can never leave us, we do know from Scripture we can quench the Spirit of God in our lives. We can grieve the Spirit of God within our lives. And the quickest way to quench the Holy Spirit in your life is to be blind to sin within your life. See, and this is what makes Psalm 51 so powerful. Look what David does. He says, I know my transgressions. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I love right here, David, he's just he's so transparent. And, there, and, there, and there, there's just no excuse. There's no blame anywhere but himself. He says, I see my sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. David committed adultery. David committed murder, and you need to know too, for a year's time, he tried to hide and rationalize this behavior. He tried to go along this path and this plan of making it seem something that it wasn't. But in the end, truth caught up to him, and the reality of what he had done, no longer could he cover it up. Loved ones, learn this from David's life. Sin left unchecked will breed more sin. Sin left unchecked it will breed, it will breed more sin. It's devastating to see what starts off as a little lie. But in order to cover the little lie, you gotta tell a bit of a greater lie. In order to cover the little lie and the greater lie, you gotta tell a really big lie. And the process goes on. If you never get back to the root of what happened in the first place, your sin starts as a little innocent thing, so to speak, and then it grows and it grows and it grows till it's this massive blotch of filth behind you and you're trying to cover it up so no one can see, but the reality is it's only a matter of time before that thing gets burst and it explodes in a disgusting filth all over you and all over all the people you love as well. That's the devastation of sin. You try to make one lie, another lie, another lie, another lie, excuse, excuse, rationalize. The whole time we have this massive time bomb ticking and it's going to go. God will make sure of it because he loves you too much. That when it goes off, what a mess. What a mess. See, because God loved David so much, what did he do? He sent Nathan. He sent Nathan. He sent Nathan to tell him what was true. And Nathan comes up and revealed by God, he tells David a story. He says, David, there were uh, two men. One was really rich and one was poor. The rich man had all the money and all the flocks and sheep and goats that he could want. And he was enjoying his lavish lifestyle. But the poor man, he had really nothing. He had one little ewe lamb. And this one little lamb, man, he, he was so tender with it, and he cared for it, and he even treated the lamb and his children like it was his daughter. It says that in the Bible. And as this lamb was his daughter, and he fed it and held it in his arms, the, the only lamb that he had, but a, a traveler came into the city, and the rich man was so selfish, he didn't want to take anything that he had, even though he had an abundance. So he goes, and he takes the little precious lamb from this poor man, the only lamb he had. He takes it, kills it, prepares it, and gives it to the traveler. What do you think about that, David? David hears the story. He's incensed. He's indignant and he's furious and he says as the Lord lives that man deserves to die and what becomes one of the more famous statements in scripture Nathan then turns to David and says David you are that man now right here loved ones right here this is a defining moment 
in the life of David. David has two options at this point when his sin is revealed and confronted to him. He can either pride up or he can either break down. He can pride up in his excuses, his blame, his rationalization, just eliminating the people that are coming against him, or he can choose to break down. Pride always blinds us to reality. Humility always causes us to see clearly. How many men and women have been brought down by God because they are not willing to be broken down? How many men and women have been brought down by God because they are not willing in their pride to break down? We have to see the moment we break down those, the moment we're built up by the Lord. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it's here. See, this is where I give David so much credit. As awful as his sin was, it's here. And the reason he's called a man after God's own heart is he knows what's right in this moment. And he chooses to break down as opposed to pride up. Nathan explains the details of David's sin. And David, all he can cry is this, I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against the Lord. And this becomes a massive turning point in David's life. Are there consequences for his sin? Yes, there are. His life would never be the same in some respects. But the reality also, even more, is the powerful mercy and love and grace of God that meets David in a time when he deserves it not. And in verse 4 of our psalm, this is when David says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Against you, God, you only have I sinned. Now, it's not that David's sin was not against Uriah or Bathsheba. And really, his sin was against the entire Jewish kingdom. It was. All the people were affected. But here's what's so key, and stay with me here. Murder in our land is a crime. It's a crime against the laws of of our land. But only before God does it become a sin. Because only before God is it breaking the law of God. Murder in our land is a crime. Only before God does it become a sin. And that's what's so devastating about sin. Ultimately, sin is an offense to God. Sin is an offense. See, David, because his heart of confession is so real, he's crying out for mercy, and he sees so clearly, all he sees is the fact that I've sinned against my God. And this, when this theology is understood in the mind and affects the heart, this becomes your greatest deterrent from sin. The reality is, against some of us here, we are sinning behind locked doors, and we find ourselves in dark rooms, and we think no one sees We are committing these indecent acts in different ways and we're uh, we're hiding because if it ever brought to light, we feel so ashamed. And we think behind those locked doors and in those dark rooms, we are doing things again no one knows. What you have to understand, what you have to know what is true, behind those locked doors and in that dark room, the sin that you are committing is being committed in the very presence of God. The holy presence of God is everywhere at all times. You cannot escape that. When we are engaging in these things, it is before and in the presence of God himself. When you think about that and you believe that to be true, it changes everything as to how you behave and who you want to be. That becomes the greatest desire for my life, for my wife, for my family, for the leaders of this church, for the people of this church, that you and I will know first and foremost, our greatest deterrent is to live in the holy fear of an awesome and righteous and loving God who cares for us so much that we would not want to ever cheat on Him. That's why I've said in the past, and I say it again, before I cheat on my wife, I cheat on my God. Before a wife cheats on her husband, she cheats on her God. And if that doesn't bring fear into the heart, the cries go up to God in a whole different way. Oh God, open the eyes that they might see. Open our eyes that we might see, oh Lord. Please, loved ones, notice in verse 4. And done what is evil in your sight. The adultery, the murder, God saw it all. The lies, God saw it all. In your sight, God. In your sight. May may that phrase stick with you forever. That when you're tempted to do something you should not do, that you would hear in your heart and mind, in your sight, oh God. In your sight. See, and this is when the heart of confession becomes so real You see so clearly, and when you see so clearly, it breaks you, it humbles you, it crushes you beautifully, though. 
beautifully. And in so, so much so, at the end of verse 4, David says, so that your words, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. You know what David's doing here? He's basically, he's full surrender, and he's like, God, you're, 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 you're totally, I'm in total agreement with you. I have no defense. I have no rebuttal. I'm not even going to try to give any kind of uh, argument back. Just, I, I agree with you. You're right, God. I totally surrendered. I have sinned. You are holy. I'm at your mercy. Oh, God, oh, God, in grace and love, here I am. Do what you will. You're blameless in your judgment. That's the genuine heart of confession. Again, see what happens here? No excuses. Man, we make excuses. No rationalization. Man, we rationalize. No fault finding. Man, we do that a lot. Notice this about a genuine heart of confession. It takes total ownership for sin. It just owns its own sin. And I'm telling you, loved ones, this is a difference maker in the Christian life. For people who are willing in their humility and right theology before God to own their sin and not make excuses, that will become a difference maker in your life. You try to cover it up, it's going to come back and hurt you bad. Here's a poem that explains this. A little beautiful, cute poem. It says, the sins that would entangle us must never be ignored. For if we try to cover them, they'll pierce us like a sword. When the sins are exposed, the power at that moment to to own them, to own them, to push pride aside, to receive the truth. Listen, to own your own sin. You can't lose when you own your sin. You can't lose. It's hard, I know. It takes so much humility, so much faith in God, but you cannot lose when you own your sin. I'm telling you, the marriages, oh, the marriages that will be blessed if the husband or the wife would own their sin. I've been in situations in the past in my own marriage. I got a lot of sin in my life. The ability in this moment, do I believe what God says or do I think I'm smarter than God? If I believe what God says, I gotta own my sin. To stare my wife in the face in the midst of an argument or something that has happened and my pride says, be right, be right, be right, and argue it's her fault and this and that. And that. But to stand in the moment and to humble myself before God first and to say, Love, I have sinned. I was wrong. I need your forgiveness. I have literally seen my wife's face go from we're in a battle. I need to defend myself. I've literally seen her face and her eyes and her cheeks soften before me as I take ownership of the sin. And all of a sudden, it goes from a fight. It goes from a time where it softens and God works and God's spirit and the reconciliation begins to happen because I believe enough in the humility to say, I am responsible for my sin. What about her? What about she? Do? She said, this. who cares about that? Who cares about you? You care about you. And you trust God with you. And you watch and see what God does. You see if he honors that. But she's going to do this. No, 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 no. Care about you. Own your sin and see what happens. Why don't we do that in our marriages? Because we're stupid. (laughs) True, it's true, pride is dumb. In our pride, we think we're smart and we're gonna win and we're only putting another nail in the coffin of our misery. How many marriages have I seen? Hurtful, his fault, hurtful, his fault. Just be quiet. And read Psalm, just, 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 just have enough humility saying you win when you own your sin. Think of the leadership. The churches own their sin. All the excuses and all the blame. Think of the Christian life. It's a difference maker for the Christian life. That's what David does here, man. There's just, there's just not one excuse coming he's like you're right God and notice how quickly God rushes to him I mean the next two weeks are going to unpack his heart being cleansed and his resolve being restored it's so beautiful think of how much we forfeit because we're not willing to trust the Lord and the things that matter most see but before you can own your sin you got to see your sin and It just so happens, David, again, he's a wonderful, amazing man in so many respects. He wrote this in Psalm 139. I mean, he got this stuff, right? He lived it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. I mean, this is a great prayer. You're like, well, I'm not really sure of the sin. You pray this prayer with a genuine desire before God, and I just, Lord, I pray you'd show us. 
Search me, O God. Search me and know me. Know my heart. It's all about the heart. Everything's about the heart. Heart. Try me, know my thoughts. So search me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me. So you see, Lord, search, try, see any offensive way in me, but lead me in the way everlasting. You take this prayer this week. You search for the Lord to speak to you. I think he's got to answer that. And when you see the sin, put it on the table and put a knife through it by the mercy of God. Watch him cleanse. Maybe that's going to happen even even today. A heart of confession that cries out for mercy. And it suddenly, suddenly it sees so clearly. Thirdly this, it, it judges sin rightly. A heart of confession judges sin rightly. Look at verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sinned in my mother conceive me. I want you to see this, Kay, where there's genuine confession, there's genuine wisdom. But a lack of genuine confession will be a lack of genuine wisdom. See, where's the wisdom? It's, it's how much he sees and understands. I mean, David is getting his theology so right. And his theology here leads to great strength when it's properly applied. But the individual who's filled with pride and denial and continuous blame on others, they're carrying around very bad theology. But David here, he's thinking clearly, seeing clearly, and therefore he's speaking clearly, and he sees the source of his sin, ready? Himself. Notice the behold in, in verse 5. It's, I think it's like David is seeing his sin in a way he's never seen before. Behold, he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. So it's not that adultery and murder was a, a, a mistake and otherwise a great heart and a great life. No, what he's saying here, what he's saying here is that his heart has never been good to begin with. He's helping us understand here, this is a good sentence, that corrupt actions flow from a corrupt nature. Corrupt actions flow from a corrupt nature. I mean, you and I both know you don't have to teach a child to sin. They just get that on their own. Little toddlers can be some of the most egomaniac, self-centered, I'm the center of the world people I've ever seen. Ever. Where do they get that from? Their nature, where do they get that from? Adam. That's what David, he's not blaming his mom for his sin. He's not saying that the conception of him was in sin. He's understanding this is called the doctrine of original sin. And since Adam sinned, all have sinned. We are born with sin, and we prove it. We prove it with our lives. G.K. Chesterton, great author of the late 19th century, early 20th century, in response to an article from a newspaper that was asking the question, what's wrong with the world today? And G.K. Chesterton, he was succinct, he was brilliant. He, he wrote back, and in response to what's wrong with the world today, he says, dear sirs, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world today? G.K. says, I am. That's a good answer. I am. That's what's wrong with the world. And that's why we're in desperate need of Jesus Christ. See, to judge our sin rightly so that we can see the solution correctly. See, one of the ways you know you have a genuine heart of confession, less and less you're concerned with the sins of others, less and less you see the speck in someone else's eye. And more and more you're, you're, you're noticing the log that is in your own. And you care about it a lot. This is when you judge sin rightly. A heart of confession cries out for mercy, suddenly sees clearly, judges sin rightly, and lastly, fourthly, it pursues powerful purity. This is exciting. A genuine heart of confession, man, they want purity because they see the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God. Let me ask you, this whole event of David's life, what is God most after? Verse 6, verse 6. You delight in truth in the inward being heart. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart, of course, heart. Why did God send Nathan to David? Remember, God sent Nathan. Why? Because God loves David. Why did David get confronted in sin and his sin? Because God loves David. Why did God call David to repentance and confession? Because God loves David. Why does God call you to confession and repentance and me? Because he loves you and he loves me. He loves us too much to let us stray. Why does repentance hurt? Because in the devastation of sin, then we find the life-giving grace and mercy of our God. 
Why does God not let you stray? Because he loves you. And why does he want to love you? Because he wants your heart. The greatest thing God wants is your heart. When he has your heart, he's got you. And when he's got you, you see him. And when you see him, you know joy, you know freedom, you know blessing, you know grace, you know love. You are satisfied in your soul because there's nothing like being filled with the holy power of the living God. What does God want from David? He wants his heart. He delights in truth in the inward being. He delights in wisdom in the secret heart. Loved ones, God is not into an external show of Christianese. He is not into a pharisaical approach of outward self-righteous behavior. He doesn't care about that. God cares about the heart. He cares about the heart. I mean, just in our very song, my favorite verses in Scripture, the sacrifices of God are a broken, a broken, what does it say, spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's what God loves. He wants our heart. So what does genuine confession do? It invites a purity of the heart. Listen, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you've been, no matter how far you've gone, genuine confession invites the mercy and purity of God into your life. Why, why? The moment we genuinely confess our sins before God, waves of mercy come. I mean, just, you've been in the ocean surf before, and the, the waves keep coming and coming, and they keep coming in and washing over you. That's the mercy of God, just inexhaustible in supply. You confess to him, the waves of mercy keep coming, and the showers of grace, the showers of grace, the showers of grace that cleanse you. And this is where freedom is known. This is where joy is known. Your sinful nature hates it. The Holy Spirit within you loves it. So today is an opportunity for truth in the inward being and wisdom in the secret heart. Loved ones today, loved ones today, together, together, listen, stop running. Stop blaming. Stop making excuses. And start receiving forgiveness for your sins in Jesus Christ. Again, what did David, what did David know? He knew that his sin was great. He knew that his Savior was greater. He knew his sin was great. He knew the grace of his God was greater. That's why he cried out for mercy. We must do the same. Stop running. Some of you are here today. You've never known forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Turn. Turn to the only one who can save you. He died for you. He died for you that you might be free. Let him love you. There are Christians here today that you've been straying from God and quenching the Holy Spirit in your life. Confess your sins to God. Give your heart to him. Allow the genuine heart of confession to take root in your life, to bear fruit in your life. I ask you, I ask you, where are you today? Does this message apply to you? And if it does, then you've got to give your heart to the Lord. And listen, why does he speak to us like this? Because he loves us. Listen, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you enough to call you back. Heart of confession sees this, loves it, and invites it. God, make us pure. Let's pray. Father, please, would you be changing hearts in our midst. You are speaking to many individuals on many levels that I have no idea about. But I know your word is true, and I know your love is strong. And I know, Lord, the two things that go together, the awareness of our sin and the amazing grace of our God. They go together. Grace isn't amazing until we see why we need it. So I pray, Lord, there would not be a discouragement or depression of sin. Instead, I'd say there's a serious view of sin and yet an overwhelming marvel at the mercy of God, the grace of God, and the love of God that would flow down upon us even now. And I pray that in turn, Lord, there would be men, there would be women, there would be children looking up to God in a new way with a new hope and saying, God, here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Take it, take it. Seal it, Lord. Use it. Refine it. I pray, Lord, we would see like never before. We would want purity like never before. God, I pray the doors would come unlocked and the light would be turned on in those dark rooms, God. I pray the games would stop being played. I pray the hypocrisy would end, Lord. I pray the self-righteousness would be smashed. And I pray instead there'd be an abandonment to God, a surrender, a love, a delight, an affection. Change hearts. You call us because you love us. 
because you love us. It's because you love us. It's because you love us.